Welcome back to the introduction to Spintronics. My name is Aurélien Manchon and I will be your guide through this sixth lecture. In the previous lectures, we have learned about basics of magnetism, its origin in matter, and how it behaves under an external magnetic field and thermal fluctuations. We have seen that upon the competition between exchange and isotropy and dipolar energy, magnetization can adopt various textures, including magnetic domain walls, skirmions, and so on. Now we have enough knowledge to finally tackle the centerpiece of this lecture, spintronics, at last. So the present lecture is about spin transport on magnetoresistive devices. In the first part, we are going to learn about charge transports in metals. In the second part, we will learn about spin transport in magnetic multilayers. And in the last part, we are going to consider spin-dependent tunneling. So let's go! The first thing we need to understand is how electrons travel through metals. In the simplest metals, like sodium, the transport is well described by Drude's model and by some phenomenological rules like Matheson's rule and Nordheim's rule. But actually, in transition metals, which are the workhorse of spintronics, those rules fail. This failure is an indication of the important role of the d orbitals. So let's see how this works. We are going to start with the simplest, but still very powerful, transport model introduced by Paul Drude in 1900. Drude considers charged particles driven by an electric field and colliding against the ions of the crystal. The transport equation is simply given by Newton's equation. Here we have the electron momentum, the electric field, and the last term accounts for the momentum relaxation when colliding against the ions. One century later, we know that this scenario is incorrect because of the periodicity of the crystal lattice. The electron wave function is described by a block state so that the electrons do not collide on the ions of the crystal. In contrast, the electrons collide on the defects and impurities that break the crystal periodicity. At the end of the day, the overall picture is the same. The current is given by the balance between the acceleration due to the electric field and the relaxation due to collision. So Newton's equation is still mostly valid in crystals. Solving this equation gives the charge current and the conductivity, which are then proportional to the relaxation time. Drude model assumes electrons behave like particles. We do know that electrons are also waves, so under which conditions does Drude model work? The answer is that it works as long as the Fermi wavelength that characterizes the electron wave is much smaller than the mean three path that characterizes the mean distance between two collisions. Drude model assumes that all electrons possess the same momentum p. Actually, in a realistic sample, you rather have a humongous number of electrons, around 10 power 28 per cubic meter. Therefore, a more appropriate manner to compute the transport properties of a metal is to use a statistical method based on Boltzmann theory of gases. Here, we consider that the electron cloud that travels through the metal is represented by a statistical distribution over the position and velocity. Instead of tracking the transport properties of each individual electron, we track the behavior of the distribution itself. An important remark is that in the present theory, we assume that the electrons do not interact with each other. In this case, Boltzmann postulates that the rate of change of the statistical distribution is balanced by the collisions of the particles against defects and impurities. So this looks pretty much like the scenario introduced by Drude, except that now we generalize it to the statistical distribution of the electron gas. The total time derivative of the distribution can be expanded in terms of partial derivatives of the position and velocity with respect to time. The time derivative of the position is nothing but the velocity, and the time derivative of the velocity is nothing but the acceleration. Now, based on Newton's law, this acceleration is directly proportional to the forces applied in the gas. Concretely, I can transform this last term in the following manner. 
the time derivative of the velocity is the force applied by the electric field, and the gradient over the velocity can be transformed into a derivative with respect to the energy. So this gives me the left-hand side of Boltzmann's equation. Now let's talk about the collision part. One can write this term as the probability for a state with velocity v to scatter toward a state with velocity v prime. W v v prime is the scattering matrix element, and I integrated over v prime to get the total scattering probability. In the following, I make a strong assumption and take this scattering matrix element as constant. I assume the electron has the same probability to scatter towards all the other states. This is called the constant relaxation time approximation, and it gives a good estimate of the conductivity as long as the scattering is driven by short-range impurities. OK, now let's solve this equation. What I'm interested in is the deviation of the electron cloud from equilibrium. So I parse the distribution into an equilibrium part, which is nothing but the Fermi-Dirac distribution, and a non-equilibrium part. That's the one I want to compute because this term is responsible for the transport properties. I use the Boltzmann equation given above, taking the derivative to zero, and I directly obtain an expression for the non-equilibrium distribution. You see that there are two terms that contribute to this distribution. The first one is driven by the electric field in agreement with Drude theory. It is called the drift term. The second term is driven by the spatial gradient of the distribution itself, which is absent from root theory. It is called the diffusion term. To calculate the charge current, I simply need to compute the integral over the momentum space of the product between the velocity and the non-equilibrium distribution. So let's derive the drift term first. I obtain this expression that reduces to that and after integration, I finally obtain this term. I can do the same for the diffusion term. I start with this expression, I reduce it, perform the integral, and I finally obtain this expression. So let's summarize. The current density is now parsed into a drift and a diffusion term. This is called the drift diffusion model. We can also obtain the charge continuity equation by directly integrating Boltzmann equation over the momentum space. This coupled equation constitutes the basic model for charge and spin transport in metals. It is parameterized by the conductivity and the diffusion coefficient, which are related to each other by Einstein relation. To conclude this discussion, let me say a few words on the types of scattering that enter the collision integral. In principle, you can imagine that many classes of scattering events occur in metals. Collisions with impurities, with defects, with phonons or electron-electron interactions. Here, I just want to mention the most important ones. Electron impurity and electron-phonon interactions. If you consider the collision between an electron and an impurity, the impurity potential seen by the electron looks like that. This is called the Yukawa potential. It is composed of the regular Coulomb interaction multiplied by an exponential factor that comes from the electron screening of the bare impurity potential. In other words, one expects that the potential of an impurity in a metal is effectively rather short. So one can model it by a Dirac potential. If you compute the collision integral of this Dirac potential, you end up with a constant relaxation rate that is proportional to the density of impurities as well as to the density of states of the electron. In other words, the larger the density of states, the stronger the scattering. This is the kind of scenario we have in mind when we make the relaxation time approximation. Now let's consider the second important scattering event occurring in metals the interaction with phonons. This interaction comes from the fact that the ions forming the crystal are allowed to vibrate and therefore can provide or absorb energy from the electronic system. 
the scattering is inelastic. It doesn't conserve the energy of the electrons. The best way to handle this interaction is to use the second quantization formalism, where one introduces creation and annihilation operators. I won't enter into details of this method, so for those who are familiar with it, I provide the expression of the interaction Hamiltonian. The terms BQ and B minus Q are the matrix elements of the electron phonon interaction. And you see that you obtain two terms. The first one accounts for the absorption of a phonon by an electron, and the second one accounts for the emission of a phonon. The important point I want to make is that because phonons obey the Bose Einstein distribution, the scattering rate due to the electron phonon interaction is actually temperature dependent. This dependence is stronger when the temperature of the metal is smaller than the by temperature. But overall, you end up with a scattering that increases with increasing temperature. The larger the temperature, the larger the vibrations of the crystal, and the stronger the electron phonon scattering is. This is in sharp contrast with the electron impurity scattering that is independent of the temperature. The study of the conductivity of metals provided interesting results long before the theoretical developments. As early as 1862, Matheson proposed a phenomenological rule. He stated that the resistivity of a given metal could be passed into a temperature-dependent contribution and a residual resistivity at zero temperature. This is something we can understand easily based on our previous discussion. The residual resistivity is due to the collisions with impurities, while the temperature-dependent resistivity is due to phonons. I give below a nice illustration of Matheson's rule by Gerritsen and Linde. They doped gold with chromium on manganese impurities and recorded the temperature dependence of its resistivity. What you see is that this temperature dependence is independent on the concentration and on the nature of the impurities at least in the limit of weak concentration. This validates the picture that electron phonons and electron impurity interactions are mostly independent of each other. Now there's another phenomenological rule proposed by Nodheim in 1931. He stated that when you tune the relative content of a bipartite metallic alloy, the resistivity should follow this algebraic law. To see how meaningful is this law, we consider another work by Linda. Here, he considered copper gold alloy and varied the relative amount of gold. So if you look at the abscissa, on the left you have 100% copper and on the right you have 100% gold. If the alloy remains disordered, then you do obtain a nice northern draw. That's what happens if you prevent the formation of crystalline phases by using thermal treatment. Now, if you grow the copper gold carefully and allow it to form crystalline phases, you end up with some abrupt variations of the resistivity. These dips are associated with the formation of highly conductive crystal phases for specific copper to gold ratios. This happens for 25%, 50%, and 75% of gold. So Nordheim's role must be used carefully. In the 30s, it was realized that many metals did not obey either of these rules. This was particularly the case for transition metals. Among the many issues posed by these metals, an intriguing one was that their resistivity was much larger than that expected from Drude theory. The solution to these puzzles was suggested by Mott in 1935. If you remember, the density of states of a transition metal like vanadium, nickel, or palladium looks like that. As we have seen in a previous lecture, at Fermi level, both S, P, and D electrons are present. Mott proposed to simplify this density of states by considering that Fermi electrons can be categorized in two main classes. The S-like electrons, which have a high velocity and a small density of states, and the D-like electrons, that possess a low velocity, but a high density of state. In this case, of course, the transport is dominated by the S-electrons, due to their high velocity. But, what Mott pointed out 
is that the scattering rate of these S electrons can be written as the sum of two terms. The scattering from an S state to an S state, called the SS scattering, and the scattering from an S state to a D state, called the SD scattering. Since the density of states of D electrons is much larger than the density of states of S electrons, the scattering rate is dominated by the SD scattering, and therefore it is quite strong. Here is the beautiful experiment that illustrates the importance of SD scattering. This experiment is due to Coles, who measured the resistivity of two intermetallic alloys, nickel copper and silver palladium. You see that the nickel copper alloy nicely obeys Nordheim's rule. In contrast, the silver palladium alloy shows a strong deviation around 40% of palladium content. This can be understood by looking at the density of states of the impurities. In the case of nickel, the D states are localized below Fermi level, and therefore adding more nickel into copper does not add much SD scattering. So we end up with a good Northern rule. In contrast, palladium has many D states at the Fermi level. Therefore, adding more palladium to silver increases the amount of SD scattering. This increase really takes off around 30% and culminates at 70% of palladium. Magnetic transition metals are even stranger. Here is the resistivity of nickel as a function of the temperature. You see that below carry temperature, in the ferromagnetic phase, the resistivity increases with a power law, and above the carry temperature, the increase becomes linear. To explain this behavior, you can consider Drude's law. According to Drude, the conductivity is proportional to the density of states. In a free electron gas, you can relate this density of states to the charge density, power one-third. So in other words, the conductivity is proportional to the charge density, power one-third. Now, let's define the polarization of the charge density at Fermi level. This allows us to rewrite the spin-dependent charge density as a function of the average density per spin times a coefficient that is linear in polarization. If you assume that the polarization is roughly proportional to the reduced magnetization, you directly obtain an expression of the resistivity of the magnetic metal that depends on the reduced magnetization. In other words, below current temperature, the SD scattering for up and down electrons is different, and therefore, the current is mostly carried by one spin species. Close to current temperature, the magnetization vanishes and one can expand the resistivity to the second order in reduced magnetization. This crude theory explains why the resistivity is smaller below current temperature and larger above it. Before moving on to discuss spin transport, I would like to complete the discussion on charge transport by addressing two important effects. The semi-classical size effect and the interfacial conductance issue. The drift diffusion theory described above applies in systems whose size is much larger than the average distance between two collisions, called the mean free path. In this case, the drift diffusion theory tells you that the conductivity of a piece of metal is independent of the thickness of the layer. This is true as long as the thickness is indeed much larger than the mean free path. When the thickness becomes comparable to the mean free path, then certain assumptions we used in solving Boltzmann equation do not apply anymore. This regime is called the Knudsen regime, or the semi-classical size effect regime. The theory of conductivity in such a regime was developed by Fuchs and Sondheimer. We consider Boltzmann equation in the reduction time approximation. We look at the charge transport in the metal layer shown below. This layer has a finite size along z and is in finite along x, the direction along which we apply the electric field. Under these conditions, Boltzmann equation reads like that. Again, we separate the contribution between an equilibrium and a non-equilibrium part and solve Boltzmann equation 
to obtain the spatial profile of the non-equilibrium distribution. So this is how the distribution varies along the direction transverse to the current. Now we need to define boundary conditions. The idea of Fuchs is to separate the distribution into electrons moving along plus z and electrons moving along minus z. At the top boundary, for instance, the electrons moving downwards are connected to the electron moving upwards by a reflection coefficient r0. If r0 equals 1, then the reflection is perfectly specular. If r equals 0, there is no connection between upward and downward electrons, and the interface is diffusive. Applying this boundary condition allows for determining the non-equilibrium distribution. Now, the charge current is simply the integration of the product of the velocity times the distribution, and we obtain the local conductivity that depends on the position along z, as well as the total conductivity which comes after integrating over the thickness. What do they look like? The top diagram shows the local conductivity as a function of the position in the transverse direction. Here, I took a diffusive interface. You see that when the mean free path is much smaller than the thickness of the metallic wire, the conductivity is constant, which agrees with Drude's model. Upon increasing the mean free path, the conductivity becomes spatially dependent and decreases substantially. That's because scattering against interfaces becomes more and more important and takes over scattering against bulk impurities. Because of that, the total conductivity of the wire exhibits a strong thickness dependence that itself depends on the nature of the interfacial scattering. If the reflection is specular, then R0 equals 1, and there is no additional scattering brought by the interfaces. In this case, the conductivity does not depend on the thickness. However, when turning on the diffusive scattering, the overall conductance shows a strong decrease when reducing the thickness of the wire. This is something that is observed experimentally, typically below 10 to 20 nanometers in most metallic thin films. There is one last thing we need to talk about. We now understand how to compute a charge current in a metallic layer. But what happens at the interface between two metals? Can we define a boundary condition? We consider the following system. We have two metals separated by an interface. This interface can be very complicated. It can even be another metal. From the quantum mechanical viewpoint, we can describe the eigenstates of each metallic layer as propagating waves. Here, the function chi is the orbital part of the wave function determined by the atomic orbitals and transverse confinement conditions. From these eigenstates, I can build the incoming and outgoing wave functions coming towards and going away from the interface, respectively. All the physics of the interfacial scattering that is determined by the wave function matching condition is contained in the coefficients al, bl, and br. I can arrange these coefficients into two vectors that represent the incoming and outgoing waves. The relation between these two vectors is determined by the scattering matrix S, which is composed of reflection and transmission matrices. Concretely, you need to calculate these matrices the hard way. But once you get them, you have all the information you need to characterize your interface. In fact, one can show that the current flowing through an interface is connected to the difference between the chemical potentials at each side of the interface. The coefficient that connects the current density and the chemical potentials is called the interfacial conductance. This relation is simply the well-known home law applied to an interface. This conductance is directly connected to the reflection and transmission coefficients of the scattering matrix. So now we have everything we need to tackle spin transport. We have drift diffusion theory to model the transport in metals, and we have boundary conditions. This concludes the first part of this lecture. The take home message is that the transport properties of transition metals are governed by the SD scattering, the scattering between the S and the D electrons.
That's a very important remark because, as we know, the d electrons are the one responsible for the magnetism. In the next part, we are going to consider how the spin degree of freedom is transported through magnetic multilayers and how it gives rise to magnetoresistance.